I know of a monk who's occasionally asked to name children, and he says he doesn't like doing it. That's the beginning of social conditioning, giving the child a sense of self. It strikes me as a strange attitude to have, because after all, everybody does need a name. As John Chalk once said, if we just called out person, 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 nobody would know who was being called. And the Buddha himself called people by their names. He didn't call them aggregates. Aggregates come here. Aggregates go away. Rahula was called Rahula, Sariputta, Sariputta. Jitta, the elephant trainer, was Jitta. There's nothing inherently wrong with developing a sense of self. In fact, you need one in order to function in this world. If you're not trained in a wise sense of self, you're going to pick up a sense of self willy-nilly anyhow. It's one of those assumptions that people just make. They're primed for it. And the question is, how do you teach someone to develop a good one? Because that's what the Dharma is all about, examining our assumptions and asking what are some skillful assumptions that we can adopt to question our old perceptions. and see what purposes they serve, because every perception serves a purpose, like when you're learning a language. In some cases, people will point things out to you and say, this is this, and this is called that, and this means this. But a lot of times you simply pick up meanings by noticing how people use words. And sometimes your assumptions are wrong, and you have to adjust them, and sometimes they work well enough that even though they may be a little off, they're okay for you, because they serve your purposes. But when you come to the Dharma, the question becomes not, how can you get rid of your social conditioning, but what purposes do you want to serve with your conditioning? In what ways do you need to be reconditioned to serve those purposes? Because our idea of a perception that's true basically comes down to, does it work well enough? And for a lot of people, well enough, or their attitude toward well enough, their definition of well enough is pretty low. And the Buddha is asking you to raise it. How about if good enough was total happiness, and anything inferior to that was not? How would you sort your perceptions out then? This is where we want to look at the Buddha's vocabulary, the way he teaches the Dharma. Because this is one of the things that's really necessary for gaining stream entry or first taste of awakening, is listening to the true Dharma, recognizing the true Dharma, and adopting its assumptions. In other words, the Buddha is going to condition us as to what kind of perceptions are useful, what kind of thought constructs are useful, what ways of fabricating our experience are going to be helpful in that direction, using these things as tools. Because we know that at some point, when the work is done, we'll be able to put our tools aside. It's like being taught how to make a chair. You have to learn how to use a saw properly, use a hammer properly, files, sandpaper, all kinds of tools. If you bring in an egg beater, it's not going to be a useful tool. If you bring in a violin, it wouldn't help. Those tools are useful for other purposes. And sometimes we have a saw already. But its blades are dull. Our hammer has been so worn through that if you hit anything with it really hard, the head's going to fly off. 
In other words, we have some tools that are okay for everyday purposes, but you're going to really need to replace them for the sake of the Dharma. So when you listen to the Dharma, remember that you're asking not only how does the Buddha describe things, but what kind of description is he replacing? When he asks the question, what questions is he not asking? This comes under the heading of appropriate attention. How you frame things in mind. And the way you frame things and the perceptions you use to provide the frame and then to fill the frame will make a huge difference. Again, think about languages. Some languages have a very extensive vocabulary for emotions. Others have more, more scientific vocabulary. It depends on what the language has been used for, and it will emphasize certain things. So in terms of the, the language of the drama, we we'll look at things in terms of one. Where is suffering? What is suffering? And then two, what's causing it? And the Buddha points out, you're going to be asking not, not who is causing it, but what, what activity. He's not saying whether there is or is not somebody behind the activity, but he wants you to look at the activity directly. So if you come to something with a very strong sense of I'm me, and I'm the kind of person who does this this way. You have to learn how to put that aside. And you're putting it aside not as a bad tool, it's just a tool that's useful for something else, like an egg beater. If you're making a chair, you don't want the egg beater. It might be useful for some other things, but it's not what you want right now. And the Buddha says that suffering is clinging clinging to the five aggregates. Okay, you want to figure out what kind of clinging there is, what kind of aggregates there are, and the different ways that you cling to the different ones. What kind of activity leads to the clinging? Well, there's craving. What leads to craving? There's feeling. And the Buddha chases it down, independent core rising. And when people would ask him, well, who is doing the feeling, he would say, don't ask. Who does the feeling belong to? Don't ask. Just look at the process of feeling. You see it comes from contact. Contact depends on the six senses, and so on down the line. He's giving you a framework for looking at things. And the framework is not the world, and it's not yourself. In fact, it's a framework that describes how you give rise to the concept of world based on your six senses, and how you give rise to a concept of self based on clinging. So you see where these things come from. You see the activities. Now, as Buddha said, you can focus on any one of these activities and try to understand where it's coming from, how it's causing suffering what its allure is, why you like doing it, and then compare the allure with the drawbacks until you really see there's nothing there. The allure is just a little tiny, tiny taste. And the, one of the Buddha's images is of a bead of honey on a blade of a knife. He's not denying that the honey is sweet. It is, but it's awfully dangerous. And when you see that, then you let go of the activity. And in letting go of that activity, it's going to start sending cracks up through other activities that help loosen up, on the one hand, your sense of the world, and on the other hand, your sense of the self. So you don't attack those things directly. You attack them by looking at activities and seeing where the all those things you do because you want to find happiness that are not causing happiness, you ask yourself, well, why? 
as long as there's an effort being put out, why expend the effort? What's gained? Now, if you were to place that question within the context of who you are, you say, well, this affirms who I am, this is just the way I am, or well, this is the way the world has to be, then it all gets frozen in place. But if you're allowed to look at the action simply as an action, analyze it in those terms, you find yourself letting go of things that otherwise you would have held on to really tightly. So when the Buddha gives his teachings, like the dependent core arising, four noble truths, three perceptions, they're a form of social conditioning too. This is why the forest tradition never describes them as ultimate truths. Their assumptions, their conventions. We use the Buddhist conventions because they serve a purpose that our ordinary conventions can't serve. His perceptions work in a way that our ordinary perceptions don't work. And this is how we test them as to whether they really are true Dhamma. Do they work, and do they work for the purpose of an end of suffering? And this is why Dhamma is closely associated with the word atta in Pali which means meaning, purpose, benefit. The Dharma, or its true Dharma, serves a benefit, serves a purpose. And that's how you test it. When you're serious about awakening, or when you have a taste of the deathless, you want to test these things in this way. As Buddha said, you want to Listen to the true Dharma from a person of integrity, who's basically a, an admirable friend. And given, as he said, that the true Dharma would disappear not long after he passed away, by which he meant that other versions of Dharma would come out. And so that the true Dharma's monopoly on being the Dharma would be called into question. He said it was like counterfeit money. When counterfeit money comes into the market, everything gets suspect. Before there was counterfeit, everybody trusted the money. They could use it as a medium. Nobody had to ask too many questions. But once counterfeit comes in, then you have to have the questions that test how do you recognize genuine, genuine money? What are the tests? In the same way with the Dharma. We have to test the Dharma. The Buddha taught the Galamas. A series of tests. He his, taught his stepmother, Gautami, a series of tests. He taught Upali, the expert of India, a series of tests. In every case, it was when you put this into practice, and that's what those conventions are meant for, to be put into practice, what are the results? If it leads to harm, okay, there's something wrong. It's not the genuine article. If it makes you burdensome on other people, if it gets you entangled a lot with other people, it's not the genuine article. If it leads to being unfettered, leads to dispassion, that's it. That's the atta by which you recognize the Dhamma. So the Buddha never said that all social conventions are bad. After all, language is a convention, and it's, he used language to teach. names or conventions, and he used them so he knew people would know who he's talking to and what he's talking about. And he used the conventions of the aggregates and the sense media and the properties to get you to look at what was going on in your experience, not in terms of who you are, although it starts out with who you are. But you begin to realize that your sense of who you are is an action, and there are times when it's a skillful sense of self, and other times when it's not a skillful sense of self. Skillful activity, unskillful activity loosens up your perception, so you start looking more and more at actions and their results. This is how you can pry apart your, your attachments and your clinging. 
in a way that's in line with the Buddhist sense of what is good enough. He said he never let himself rest content with skillful qualities until he had found the real thing. And that's the attitude he's asking you to take, too. <laughs>